Welcome to C++ Club. This is meeting 152 that took place on the 4th of August 2022. As a prelude to the main topic, we are going to briefly discuss this article posted on the Google Security Team blog. It's called Retrofitting Temporal Memory Safety on C++. It's an article on their progress. They talk about temporal safety improvements, which mitigate uh, use after free errors, as opposed to spatial safety, which is about dealing with out of range access like buffer overflows. So the current state of the art ways of for ensuring temporal safety are static analysis, which doesn't see all the errors, sanitizers, which slow down program execution significantly, smart pointers, you should use them. And also, Chrome has a garbage collector called OilPan, but that changes C++ semantics. And there is also the class called Miracle Pointer, which ensures deterministic crash on dangling pointer access. The new mitigations discussed in the article are memory quarantine, heap scanning, and memory tagging. By the way, when I read this, I noticed that they don't mention the core guidelines and the uh, memory safety and safety against use after delete that's implemented there. Yeah, they, they have their own guidelines that they follow, which sort of makes their C++ a bit non-standard. Uh, the memory quarantine is explained as follows. The basic idea is to put explicitly freed memory into quarantine and only make it available when a certain safety condition is reached. The main idea behind assuring temporal safety with quarantining and heap scanning is to avoid reusing memory until it has been proven that there are no more dangling pointers referring to it. To avoid changing C++ user code or its semantics, the memory allocator providing new and delete is intercepted. Upon invoking delete, the memory is actually put in a quarantine where it's unavailable for being reused for subsequent new calls by the application. At some point, a heap scan is triggered, which scans the whole heap, much like a garbage collector, to find references to quarantined memory blocks. Blocks that have no incoming references from the regular application memory are transferred back to the allocator when they can be reused for subsequent allocations. So this is sort of like a garbage collector, but not really, as you still have to manage memory manually. Who invokes this scanning? Does it trigger by itself somehow magically? It's, yeah, it's like runtime or whatever thread is doing that in Chrome. Maybe there is some sort of setting that states, you know, once you add something this dimension, then you're going to have to scan or something. So maybe there is some customization you can do, but eventually you're going to pay the price for this sometime in the code. Yeah. There are several mem uh, versions of these memory scanning algorithms collectively called star scan or asterisk scan, literal asterisk character. Try Googling that. <laughs> there is a small problem when used in Chrome, star scan slows it down by 12%. So uh, hardware memory tagging comes to re the rescue here. It's a new extension of ARM architecture to help detect spatial or temporal memory errors. This is how it works. Every 16 bytes of memory are assigned a 4-bit tag. Pointers are also assigned a 4-bit tag. The allocator is responsible for returning a pointer with the same tag as the allocated memory. The load and store instructions verify that the pointer and memory tags match. In case the tags of the memory location and the pointer do not match, a hardware exception is raised. Combined with star scan, memory tagging lowers the performance regression to just 1%. So these are the latest memory error mitigations from Google. But they seem to be oriented towards fixing memory errors in code that uses new and delete which are discouraged in modern C++. We've had smart pointers since C++ 11. Well, auto PTR doesn't count. 
I'm sure this is a simplistic view of things, but and I don't know all the details, of course, but what if, and bear with me here, Google used smart pointers in their C++ code base instead of coming up with elaborate ways to fix C-like C++ code. This mitigation will still trigger even if you use smart pointers because they will still intercept the underlying call to new and to delete, so... Yeah, but I they think, uh, would alleviate the dangling... I mean, yeah, that would be wasteful, I think, you know, you would be using yeah. a smart pointer, so you wouldn't need this. But I think this would still get triggered because they, the intercepted call to new will still be called and you still have this underlying magic maybe mitigated by this hardware uh, also magic that you mentioned, but still. Yeah, yeah. So uh, here's a quote from a tweet by Titus Winters. There's a load bearing 10 billions of lines of code in C++ and it can't be usefully improved. Hmm. As the next item will demonstrate, improving the existing C++ code base is not an acceptable solution to Google. What they chose to do instead was to create an entire new language. Enter Carbon. The new experimental language Carbon was unveiled by Chandler Kruth in his CPP North conference talk. I think it's a terrible name for a language. Google couldn't choose a name that you can actually Google? Oh wait, I know, it's a pun in itself. A play on C, the language, which is also the chemical symbol for carbon. It's so clever, it overflows and becomes stupid. I agree with that, yes. It's, uh, I hope that wasn't the reasoning, but it's entirely possible. Also, apparently, carbon in the context of software is trademarked by Apple. Apple Carbon is the name of a legacy Mac OS application programming interface. Maybe they plan to change also the name, given that the ethos of the language is just let's break it every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, quite possible. They would call it Bourbon next time. Yeah, why not? So I watched the talk by Chandler. And here are some quotes from it. Quote, C++ is not doing as well as we would like. C++ is very unsafe. End quote. So what is the root cause for C++ falling short of its goals? Quote, accumulated decades of technical debt and prioritizing backwards compatibility. End quote. I know where this is going, ABI and backwards compatibility. Quote, backwards compatibility prevents us from fixing technical debt. This is not a recipe for success. Hmm. C++ evolution process makes improvements even more difficult. And they have a, a whole document on their website called Difficulties Improving C++. Chandler says that's why C++ has failed. Has it though? What he really is implying is C++ has failed Google. And Carbon is an answer no, to that. No, it has failed Google according to some people at Google. Yes. I have not been able to determine whether Carbon is or is going to become a Google language or a language promoted by some people who it's not the same thing. Yes, yes, uh, that's, that's right. There are teams at Google that are not involved in this in any way, so it doesn't seem like an official Google um, move. It's just a, a certain team that is uh, doing this an, as an experiment. Uh, so, Carbon is an experimental successor to C++, and the main design goals for it are C++ interoperability, that's like the ultimate uh, goal. The next one is migration support, so that any code base in C++ would be able to migrate to Carbon uh, incrementally. And language evolution which means tool-based upgrades as carbon improves, specifically 
no backwards compatibility or stable ABI. Carbon tries to make parsing code simpler as well by adding more syntax. For example, these keywords act as introducers. Um, and you can see them in the some of the screenshots with examples uh, on Google's GitHub. Fn introduces functions, var introduces variables, and let introduces constants. Hi Scala. The if statement is actually an expression, like in Scala, or maybe also in Rust, I'm not sure. There are no references, just pointers. Output parameters of functions are pointers with a fancy new syntax, which are non-nullable and non-incrementable. Interestingly, the current Google C++ style guide requires using non const pointers, not references for output parameters. There is also an explicit object parameter for class methods. Yeah, they are called methods, not, not member functions. Uh, which is sort of like deducing this in C++, which can be prefixed with the keyword adder to become mutable. It's totally intuitive. Files define namespaces via packages, and there is no global namespace. Members of a class are public by default. Uh, this is copied from Kotlin. And they can be, be declared private by using the keyword private before each of them. There is single inheritance only, and classes are final by default. You can use base prefix to enable inheriting from a class. There are generics with definition checking, like the initial C++ OX concepts proposal. They are defined using the keyword interface. Pure virtual functions are marked with the abstract keyword. If you define an interface, you can then implement it and then accept it in a function with checking. You have to explicitly opt into an interface. This also enables extending classes you don't own, like extension points. There is no ADL in Carbon. To prevent ODR violations, class extensions can only come from the original class or the interface declarations. So you, you can't extend an arbitrary third-party library willy-nilly in your code. I'm personally disappointed at the missed opportunity to adopt colon equals as an assignment operator. The carbon designers seem to love syntax. I hope they provide a pronunciation guide for it. Chandler admitted that C++ is going to be here for a very long time, therefore the most important point is C++ interoperability. You can import C++ headers for header files with a statement import cpp, where c is uppercase and pp is lowercase. Weird. Library, and then the name of the header file. And that synthesizes a matching carbon AST by using C++ frontend, like Clang, which is then imported into carbon. All the tooling for carbon is currently based on Clang by the way, but uh, they say it's not mandatory, and in the future other tool chains might be able to support carbon. The imported... pay would probably decide all the new directions, I think that. So, I mean, other people can also implement tool chains, I guess, but this is Google technology, right? So if they want to change it, there's no other process than they want to, or maybe you can submit a pull request, but they, if they don't like it, I guess they are not going to approve it. Yes. Uh, the other way around is when C++ imports a carbon package as a header file with a statement uh, hash include, say, foo.carbon.h, and treats the content of that package as a namespace foo. This is based on the old Clang modules, not the new C++ modules. It also reminds me of how Swift and Objective-C interop works. Probably they use that for their inspiration. Come to think of it, 
How will this work with C++ 20 modules, you know, the proper ones? They haven't mentioned anything towards that. I think there's still a lot to be decided, I guess. There's a lot they haven't decided yet. That keeps being the answer. Well, it'll work in the future. People can imagine that will work, and it might. Uh, but I do note that uh, their modules are not C++ modules. Their concepts are not C++ concepts, and they don't yet have routines. This looks very good to me. So how are they going to integrate the, the new modules once everybody in C++ will use the new C++ modules? They will have to support those and their modules? Uh, is this interoperability with C++ going to become a, a problem for them eventually? Are they going to break entirely? Only time will tell, I guess. Yeah. Or they may kill it, you know, as... One question would be, how yeah. much can you interoperate? Which subsets of each language can interoperate with which subset of the other language? Yeah. Because they are definitely different languages. Yeah. That's true. Finally, Chandler explained what the carbon language process was going to be. It's not ISO, but a community process, including GitHub, Discord, and other modern collaboration tools, similar to Swift, I'm guessing. The license is LLVM. The language evolution process will be based on GitHub pull requests. For bigger decisions, there is a governance process headed by Chandler Carruth, Kate Gregory, and Richard Smith. So yeah, uh, like you said, Gianluca, they are free to reject any pull requests that they don't like. We have to hope that they are not evil, ah. as we have been hoping. <laughs> that ship has sailed a long time ago. <laughs> they even removed it from the official... Uh, uh, website. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Back to carbon. Uh, batteries included. Everything is provided out of the box, including tools, ecosystem, package manager, eventually, etc. The build system is Bazel. I like this quote by Oliver Smith on Twitter. Looks at carbon, sees Bazel, deletes search history, throws computer out of the window. Speaking from experience, I guess. The slide uh, in the presentation with the current contributors to Carbon had some notable names in it, including Kate Gregory, David Sankel, Chandler Carruth, Daisy Holman, Hanna Dusikova, Matt Goldbolt, and Richard Smith. Companies and organizations involved so far are Google, Adobe, and Indiana University. There were some live examples of Carbon Code using VS Code as an IDE. Also, Compiler Explorer supports Carbon already. In the Q&A session, the following statements were made. There is no metaprogramming or reflection story for Carbon at the moment. There will be an independent foundation for developing Carbon, but at the moment it's governed by Google Contributor License Agreement, CLA, which is a showstopper for many people. Inspiration was drawn from Rust, Zig, Haskell, and Kotlin, and also Swift. Swift was used for generics. Carbon will have no fixed library ABI. When you build a Carbon program, you build everything, just like Google does now, no surprise. There will be a way to define a stable ABI on the boundary, which is a rare case, as uh, Richard Smith has said, or they were hoping for it to be a rare case. Source compatibility will be handled by tooling. Richard Smith said, a really easy way of migration. There may be some amount of versioning or epochs even. I personally get worried when I hear the words really easy in a context like this. Build system will not be necessarily basal. Oh, that's a relief. 
for C++ interop, C++ 17 is the baseline, but obviously that may move with time. There will be no support for old hardware architectures. So people were guessing that 32-bit architectures are out, which could mean that 32-bit controllers will not support carbon. Governance. There will be rotations of the three benevolent dictators. The goal is to end up with a bench of people who have been a lead, according to Chandler Cruz. It will be a layered consensus model with tiers of escalation, like small groups. This sounds like a committee with working groups. Carbon will be willing to break old code. In my opinion, this is actually pretty inconvenient, as I experienced it with Swift until it finally reached source stability. The migration tool sucked. Source stability is good. It's unclear what the change rate will be, and the users will be able to influence the process. Hmm, how about three years? As little undefined behavior as possible, but there will be C++ boundary with potential UB. Richard Smith says, if there is UB, we will provide you with the ability to check for it. Ooh, I'd like to see how they do that, as we previously discussed an article by Chris Latner, who demonstrated that diagnosing UB is a really hard problem. Especially if, given that they don't want to go all the way like Rust uh, to specify the lifetimes of everything. They want to have something in the middle between C++ and Rust, but not commit all the way. So you still be able to do a lot of the undefined behavior that you can uh, with C++. And they probably slap on sanitizers as usual, I guess. Yeah. I, I have sort of used to comment on carbon because it's simply too unspecified or underspecified to make a technical comment on. And I'm going to, to stick to this uh, in, in any detailed technical comment. So just premature as I suspect the language is. If I try to release something like this from at and in the case of C++, I would have been ever so politely told to get it working first. I wonder how much that is also kind of by design. If if they keep it vague, then everybody kind of can read whatever they want in, into this. That's right. People always assume that once things are fixed, it will be fixed in the way they yeah. imagine it should be fixed. And they will imagine that no serious problems will be found during the evolution process. So it's obvious that if you have a much smaller of people controlling and contributing, it's much easier to well control. Um, the problem with the current C committee it is so darn popular. We have hundreds of people who want to help. That is uh, a problem indeed. How how do you go about trimming? Maybe that's another topic for another day, but yeah, how do you go about trimming that? Uh... Can't trim. Because one of the rules of anything political, and anything that has voting is political, is that people don't give up uh, power they've got. And so you tell a nation or a company or an individual that, no, you can no longer vote. Uh, we, we, we have some stable group of dictators that will decide whether your ideas are good enough and whether your ideas are worth doing right now. This is not going to happen. This is just not the way uh, an open organization can work. It's the way a corporation can work. But, uh, it's the advantage of a corporation or a dictatorship. But I do not know how to solve this problem in the context of WD21 under ISO rules. It is very, very difficult, and you end up having to talk, 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 and convince a lot of people. What if the people who are now interested in carbon and not 
interested in particular in advancing C++ anymore or became disillusioned by the ISO process and the committee, leave to work on Carbon and by doing that, indirectly improve C++ process. I have heard that suggestion, but I think the net effect will be that energy and uh, resources will leave the C++ community, just as it happens when Sun pushed Java and started hiring uh, good C++ people because they knew how to build systems. Uh, so Carbon will try and rec uh, recruit good C++ people because, well, they can build things. And the net effect on C++ is, I think, more likely to be negative than positive, even though there are people who have suggested positive. I guess uh, we, we're going to end up in, potentially, we may end up in a fragmented situation where some vocal members of the C++ community that overall were driving things forward will now move or will be tempted to move to to carbon in a way and so some people may want to instead of focusing on C++ as students maybe they would want to try carbon carbon or go that... or rust or swift or yeah bell or one of the other hmm. couple of dozen languages that wants to take on C++. C++ has a big target on its back, and everybody who wants to do sort of serious systems work wants to be the next C++. And so this goes with the territory. Interestingly, exceptions were not mentioned in the talk at all, and nobody asked about them during Q&A. I asked uh, John when I talked to him. He said it was uh, there wasn't any just yet, but it wasn't decided. Right. At least Chandler doesn't consider exceptions evil as such. But, uh, oh, that's a really we we will see. Well, that doesn't mean that, well, it doesn't mean anything. It's undecided. I wonder if they would at least uh, move towards more like static. Uh, herbceptions kind of design because they wouldn't uh, in Google they, they don't use the normal exceptions uh, already yeah uh, this Google was deep deep into undisciplined use of pointers before they discovered C++ so it existed they, uh, for, for years they didn't allow any form of this sort of confirms my suspicion that Google positions Carbon as a successor to the Google's flavor of C++, where exceptions are already prohibited. But maybe, maybe... We will see. We will see. It is too early to make strong statements about Carbon. At least it is too early for me to make strong statements about Carbon. Come to think of it, there wasn't any mention of Carbon error handling at all. Peter Dimov tweets, presumably quoting Carbon Docs. For now, Carbon does not have language features dedicated to error handling, but we would consider adding some in the future." End quote. To which Viktor Zverovich predictably replies, Carbon developers simply write code that always succeeds. And more from Viktor, breaking. The C++ committee threatens to add new features faster than Carbon is able to support them. Doug Greger tweeted, it's a subtweet, just to remind uh, you, a subtweet is sort of a passive-aggressive reference to something you don't mention directly. Uh, quote, I don't think any programming language unveiled in 2022 should lack memory safety. We have to move on from the it must be as, as fast as unsafe C mindset because the engineering cost of unsafe by default is so very high. Nice syntax and whiz-bang features don't make up for it. It takes an enormous amount of effort to bring a new language into the world and make it useful, to port code, re-implement core libraries. If you aren't getting safety out of it, why incur that cost? Is the end result actually better or just more pretty? I know a thing or two about programming language design and trade-offs. I'm saying that not making a new language memory safe by default is, to me, 
a critical error that you cannot recover from once you have users. End quote. And to remind you, Doug Gregor helped create Swift. Wille Wutilainen, regarding carbon generic concepts interfaces, tweeted, I will be really interested to see how you write generic duct typed uh, glue functions that take two arbitrary types without opting in to either. That is, if that's possible. And the puns, all oh, the puns. Viktor Zverovich again. If you write spaghetti code in carbon, do you get carbonara? Marius Banchila replies, If you copy-paste code in carbon, do you get carbon copies? On a more serious note, there are some quotes from Reddit, which has even two threads discussing carbon, and also some hacker news quotes. Jonathan Müller, quote, To give some context, in February of 2020, there was a crucial vote in the C++ Standard Committee about breaking ABI compatibility in favor of performance, mostly pushed by Google employees. The vote failed. Consequently, many Googlers have stopped participating in the standardization of C++, resigned from their official roles in the committee, and development of Clang has considerably slowed down. Now they've revealed that they've been working on a successor language to C++. This is really something that should be taken seriously." End quote. A reply to that goes, counterpoint, no, Google is one of, if not the worst, maintainer of languages there is. Their methodology is exactly what you see here, our way or the highway. Their documentation is snarky, where they insist some hacky way of doing something is the right way of, to do it. It is always written in a condescending manner. Their developer resources are insulated from critique and criticism, where they are in charge, and if you disagree, too bad. Let them do their thing and take their toys and play in their sandbox at home away from anybody. They won't have to share, but they'll get bored with it and kill it in two years anyhow. This is based on the contributors experience with Go and how it was handled by Google. So somebody mailed me a link to the Google graveyard. Yes, I was I was going to mention that. It's good. Um, so this poster says, I don't want to imply anything, but coming up with a new language after losing a vote about a standardized language is a bit like an angry child throwing a tantrum transposed to the giant tech company world. A reply to that was, the sentiment is blatantly uncharitable. If anything is difficult to understate, the importance of C++ at Google. They didn't spend billions upon billions writing hundreds of millions of lines of C++, only to throw it all away over a few rejected proposals. Indeed, it's one thing to lose a vote on a proposal, but it's another thing to lose faith in the standardization process as Google has. There was a, another very long and detailed comment that I'm not going to cite because it's so long, but it's very insightful and interesting, so go and read it. I'll be linking to it in the show notes. Jonathan Müller responds on Twitter to countless people in the Reddit comment section. No, somebody implementing their own language after they've failed to change an existing one isn't throwing a tantrum. Programming languages are tools. If they don't work for you, switch. If no alternative exists, invent one. My take on it is that, like Yubiana said earlier, one outcome of the Carbon project which is already happening, is that some very notable people who used to work on advancing C++ are now going to go and work on Carbon. And so C++ may lose. But we'll see how this plays out. And uh, to mention uh, this sad website, the fact that Google is behind Carbon also suggests that there is a non-zero possibility the entire project will be abandoned in a few years. And this is killed by Google website, which has many good things, but are no more. Enough time has passed. 
since the initial announcement that hot takes and reaction videos started to appear. TechRadar posted an article titled Google thinks its new programming language can topple C++, and so did 9to5Google website. I suggest you watch this short video clip by Code Report, which is Connor Hextra, called Carbon Language, the C++ Killer. And I thought the video was very good and very funny. Another video is a first impressions video from the creator of Odin programming language. And no, I haven't heard of that one either before. A recent Reddit post titled What is ABI and why did Google create their own language for it? has many links on ABI, including articles and videos. Bryce Lelbuck and Connor Hextra have a podcast together called Algorithms plus Data Structures equals Programs, in short, ADSP. And they had an entire episode talking about carbon. Uh, some quotes from the episode. Bryce says, Carbon evolution process is drastically 10 times better than the C++ ISO evolution process, which is rather dated. Bryce is much more optimistic about the future of carbon and rust because of that than the future of C++. Reminder, this is the person that wants to be in charge of C++ evolution. He said he hopes and the, that... And the person that has attacked the, the ISO in public. He said he hopes that the C++ process can be fixed in the future to not be tied to ISO. In other words, C++ leaving ISO. <laughs> Connor says, why not just make C++ better? Bryce replies, people who created Carbon spent a decade trying to make C++ better, and it didn't work out, end quote. Didn't work out for them? It's a bit of a weird statement, to be honest. Is he saying there was no progress in C++ for the last 10 years? He names other people, Doug Gregor, Dave Abrahams, who tried to make C++ better, but then departed to make other languages, notably Swift. Dave Abrahams is back to C++, but Bryce says he's not involved in the committee, at the moment at least. Bryce says, we should be willing to breaking changes to fix mistakes, end quote. And not only because of performance considerations, but also to fix things like defaults. And Connor... Very, it's very hard to get agreement on a mistake. And even when you agree, it's very difficult to know how many millions or billions of lines of code depends on that mistake. Yeah. That's one of the fundamental problems that any successful language has to face, and any novel language which you users don't have to face, unless it gets successful. Connor talked about fixing C++ defaults, all those constexts for no discard we have to add because they weren't available when the defaults were decided. Bryce said that Carbon doesn't have to get the defaults right because they will be able to fix them later by breaking things. So then when you are looking at Carbon code, you have to know its version or revision in order to understand what is implied because the defaults will change between versions? Will there be a way to specify which version of Carbon is used in a particular file? How will the upgrade tooling deal with it? Will it be possible to combine Carbon versions in a single program? I think it's going to be called Carbon Dating. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So yeah, looks like Bryce is super enthu enthusiastic about carbon, and only time will tell how this will affect his involvement in C++. Bryce refers to the CPP North keynote by Sean Parent, 
titled The Tragedy of C++. There is no video available yet, but some quotes are What makes a tragedy a tragedy it requires the protagonist to be successful, or the story is simply tragic and not a tragedy. C++ is successful. In Act 1 we explored the reasons why C++ is successful in introducing our character. In Act 2 we looked at how some of the very strengths of C++ can also be very damaging. Jonathan Müller posted an article on his blog on Carbon's function parameter passing titled Carbon most exciting feature is its calling convention. Quote By default, if you don't write anything else, Carbon parameters are passed by the equivalent of a constref in C++. However, and this is the important part, the compiler is allowed to convert that to a T to a value under the as if rule. Jonathan claims that the Carbon compiler will do the right thing so that you don't have to think about it, selecting the best way to pass a concrete type. C++ can also optimize away const references and replace them with values, but apparently this creates a copy, whereas in Carbon it doesn't. I'm not sure how this works with primitive types though. He says that in Carbon the value is simply set into a register. For primitive types it's a copy, isn't it? I think uh, the, the idea is that the language will be able to decide whether the object is small enough to fit into a register and then just shove it into registers uh, if you can. Whereas in C++ there is uh, ABI reasons why you cannot, in, in cases where, for instance, there is an non-trivial destructor, you cannot put things that would fit into register, you cannot just pass them in registers anyway. And, uh, and the claim here, if I understood correctly, is that uh, given that they can break ABI, they can actually put things that fit um, into register and improving performance. That is what I gathered here. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan says that the C++ optimization is limited because function signatures are, uh, signature is part of ABI, but in Carbon, we don't care about that, of course. Another advantage that Jonathan is especially excited about is that in Carbon you can't get address of a parameter unless it's specially annotated. When you can't take a parameter address, the compiler can avoid escape analysis. Uh, parameters can't be indirectly and unexpectedly modified in the function. Jonathan really dislikes C++ references. In the Reddit thread he said, quote, References are misfeatures. The language is better off without them. For example, const ref parameters are unnecessary, it's the default. He clarifies further, quote, References were added to C++ to allow operator of loading that return L values like indexing. Given that by design they act like aliases to other objects, they are problematic to generic code, see optional of reference, and heavily complicate the type system. There is a lot of complexity in C++ solely because of reference types. If references did not exist and the few use cases where they're really useful replaced with different features, returning L values from functions, parameter passing, lifetime extension, range 4, C++ would be a lot simpler. It wouldn't be a C++ oh, would it? In the same reply he also said of carbon concepts, quote, the language has concepts and the far superior C++ OX version, not the stripped down sugar for Sfine we've gotten in 20." End quote. He, he seems to be very light, doesn't he? We are witnessing a lot of venting about C++, aren't we? <laughs> I think uh, there's a lot of pent up emotions here, you know, since yeah. that, uh, that original um, CPP uh, talk about the unique pointer not being able to be passed in register. I think that's that's the, the, the initial seed of all of these, which then led to the yeah, report. Of it. And, uh, the, the suggestions to fix that problem is never taken serious by the people in the criticism. It's the ABI that's doing it. Yeah. Actually, unique pointer can be passed in a register. It's just a pointer in a structure. So if you pass it by, you move it all the time. Yeah, it goes in, in a register. Yeah, but that's not what their ABI says. So oh, it depends what you put in your ABI. 
if I if I remember correctly, you can pass a structure if, that is trivial in registers, but you cannot pass a structure that is non-trivial that has, for instance, you know, a non-trivial destructor. You cannot pass pass that in a register, and that's uh, ABI uh, specification. All right. Tristan Brindle had some feedback on Twitter. Quote, I think this could actually be good for C++. Carbon can move fast, innovate, and make mistakes that can be corrected. The successful ideas can be backported to C++ in a compatible way without the pressure of having to get it right first time. It's like C++ playground of sorts. Continuing his quote, as to the language itself, Signature-based checked generics are clearly the way forward. As an aside, it's interesting that Swift, Rust, and now Carbon have all converged on a generics model very close to C++ OX concepts, a validation of Doug Gregor's ideas. What we could have had. The memory safety story, we'll figure that later, is a concern. Likewise, error handling. It seems like exceptions will be necessary for C++ for C++ interop, but will they be idiomatic in Carbon? Or will it be monadic error types like other modern languages? Or something similar to herpceptions? Syntax quibbles, mandatory semicolons, seem dreadfully old-fashioned in a language designed in 2022. I like this guy's optimism, but uh, <sighs> I think if it was possible to backport any of the improvements to C++, probably those improvements would have been done already in C++. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I like the proof that the three-year update cycle is uh, too slow for half of the C++ users. I don't know how you defend that half, but it's certainly too uh, fast for the other half. <laughs> yeah. And we don't know what the half uh, refers to. Half of people on Reddit or half of people who develop stuff and don't post half of people who post on Reddit, probably. There is an unofficial Carbon subreddit. You can go check it out. And recruiters, don't waste any time. Not sure if this is real, but this tweet shows a photo of a job posting which requires 10 years of Carbon experience. No exceptions and C++ doesn't count. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think uh, we'll end up on this today, and I'm sure we'll discuss Carbon later, despite the fact that uh, this is called CPP Club, because it's related to C++ anyway. And I will leave you with this excellent post by Amir Kesh. It's a photo of several fast food customers fighting each other and the other guy just sitting there eating his food, looking at his phone. The fighting people are labeled Nim, Carbon, Go and Rust and the guy eating his food is labeled C++. Right. Thank you very much for joining and we'll continue that next time. Bye. Cheers. Bye.